Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here. It's Tuesday, the 16th day of November 2021. It is hard to believe the year has gone by so fast. Thanksgiving next week, so we'll talk about that a little bit in terms of what you might expect for travel in the lower 48 discussion portion of this discussion. And, of course, we'll take a look at some things related to the tropics. Even when things are very quiet, there's interesting things going on related to that quiet. And so, you know, here we are. We, ha we don't have any hurricanes to talk about, but it's the lack of hurricane activity, global tropical cyclone activity, that leads off today's update. So let's get started with it. A tweet here from the University of Wisconsin up there in Madison, the Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies right here, tweeting out that no currently active storms. That's the, uh, the headline. Anywhere across the globe right now, and in fact, as Dr. Klotzbach was alluding to recently, the Earth generated the lowest accumulated cyclone energy, ACE, this past month in the entire satellite era since 1966. So you're not going to see a lot of news headlines about that usually, and that's just the way it goes. Not trying to pick sides here or talk about media bias, but the headlines of doom and it's scary and Cat 5 hurricanes and the strongest typhoon ever. Those generate headlines, those generate views on social media. We all know that. This, on the opposite side of that extreme, is just as interesting. It's just not as exciting. Inherently, it's just not. I understand that. But I think it's also very fascinating at the same time. Why? Why are we having this dearth or lack of activity in the tropics? I don't know. There's people working on it, probably. Uh, with all the other stuff going on in the world, though, you know, we'll take this break because we know how things can go. The pendulum can swing into extremes as quickly as you can blink your eye. You know how it can be. So things are pretty quiet. That's good. We can see that reflected in the satellite animation this afternoon. A little bit of convective activity in the Western Caribbean, a little bit more here over in the Eastern Pacific. But generally speaking, the upper level winds are just too strong coming out of the eastern Pacific here all the way across, very strong upper level wind, uh, almost like a subtropical jet, if you will. Uh, another little feature out here east of the islands, and that's about it. Everything else uh, is mid-latitude based, you know, different storms up here in the high latitudes to mid-latitudes out of the tropics as we transition away from hurricane season in the northern hemisphere. You know, the tropical cyclone season will be beginning in the southern hemisphere, and we'll be keeping track of that, of course, uh, keeping track, you know, for Australia um, and you know, the islands, that, what is it, Vanuatu, the Philippines are always in play. You just never know. They're not in the southern hemisphere. But for the Atlantic Basin, it's all just about done, at least from a calendar perspective. I think nature turned everything off about five or six weeks ago, honestly. So here we are. So here's what's happening. Nothing, really. A little bit of energy here approaching the islands. There's that area. Very low vorticity values near Central America. A little bit more concentrated vorticity in the eastern Pacific. Most of the energy is associated with these mid-latitude and high-latitude storms. There's a little ocean storm out there in uh, just getting into the subtropics. But that's it. We're, we're leaving the tropical cyclone season in the northern hemisphere behind. Generally, again, the western Pacific, you never know. You can get some you know, strong typhoons in December, pretty much year-round out there with that warm pool that surrounds the uh, the West Pack over to the Philippine Sea and the South China Sea, etc. But right now, it's quiet, so we'll take that and enjoy it. Because again, we know how things can change uh, year after year over year. You just never know. So what we'll do is we'll start looking at different puzzle pieces as we go forward related to next year's hurricane season. We'll keep track of that in the off season about once per week and how this affects our daily weather. And that would be the La Nina here in the Pacific. Uh, some of these values in here, four or five Celsius below the long-term average. You contrast that to the very warm Atlantic basin uh, from the equatorial region all the way up to the high latitudes here, the subtropics and beyond. Very warm and this big contrast is really interesting in and of itself. The cold Pacific on one side, the warm Atlantic on the other, having big uh, implications for weather patterns globally, and of course the tropical cyclone season for next year. We will be watching this to see how this evolves. Does that La Nina moderate and become more of a 
warmer signal does the Atlantic stay as warm or does it start to cool off? We don't know. There's different climate models that we can look at. I'll show you one of those in just a minute. And uh, that's the kind of stuff we'll watch in the coming weeks and months. We'll also keep an eye on actual sea surface temperatures. So this is the departures, the anomalies. This would be your actual SSTs for the Gulf of Mexico. 26 Celsius running right about like this or close to 80 degrees Fahrenheit pretty much like I'm outlining here in the general sense. So a good deal of the Gulf of Mexico is still warm enough for activity, but there's no disturbances. The upper level winds are too strong, too much dry air, and just no areas of energy coming in to speak of. Uh, so we really don't worry about it once we get into November. Yet this warm Gulf will help to fuel winter storms. These Miller A storms, they get their start a lot of times in the Northwest Gulf. They move across and then they head up the East Coast, sometimes quite formidable. The spring severe weather season that will eventually set up into next year where you pump that warm, moist Gulf air into the lower 48, even parts of the lower Mississippi Valley. Dixie Alley, that tornado alley area, uh, kind of a thing, I guess, and the traditional tornado alley spots for next year. This matters. The warm Gulf of Mexico will actually be a part of that. And so we can monitor that. Actual sea surface temperatures, the departures from normal. Hey, there's windows talking to me from somewhere in my office. Um, so yes, this will be one of the puzzle pieces that we watch. This though is the big one. And this is over at Storm 2K, as you can see there. And is the, it is the ENSO updates thread. ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. That's that acronym, different people discussing different topics. But this one from Luis or Cyclone I stood out to me um, and it's the discussion here and the graphic from the uh, Climate Prediction Center uh, International Research Institute CPC IRI. What does this show? Well this shows where we are. Let's let's just bring this out into a new image shall we? I'll try it one more time here. Da, da, da. There we go. So this shows us where we are now La Nina and then the forecast from the different models going forward into time into 2022 there, as you can see, uh, by the spring, we start to lose the La Nina, develop more of a neutral signal according to the models. This is several months out. You know how that can go. But the general thought is very low probabilities of the red bars, right? What are those? That is the El Nino probability. And those probabilities are very, very low, at least for now. Uh, and this gets us into the June July, August time frame, as you can see down in the right hand corner there, JJA, that's June, July, August. So neutral, neutral conditions. Those, those are the years that you really have to watch for landfalls. And I'll show you, I'm going to talk about that in January. Can't give it all away right now. You know, we won't have much to talk about later, but I'm going to show you an analysis of past hurricane seasons. And we're just going to do that on a weekly basis. Let's look at all the La Nina years. And we'll take a look at those maps and how many hurricanes we had. We'll look at the El Nino years and then we'll look at the neutral years week after week and we'll sort of build this idea of what to look for as we go forward into 2022. All right, what to look for? Well, you might be traveling next week. We'll talk about that in a moment. For now, today's weather, the lower 48 weather, mainly highlighted by wind and red flag warnings here in parts of the front range of the Rockies uh, and even the Rockies proper up here through Wyoming and Montana. But no big storms, just a lot of wind out there in the nation's midsection. Um, but nothing gigantic, you know, where it's affecting huge population centers. Yes, there's still some remnants of that atmospheric river and its effects in the Pacific Northwest. Flood warnings, evacuations in parts of British Columbia I was seeing pretty wet up there. And uh, that at least has calmed down as of late. But the main focus is going to be what's coming related to this. And I was looking for this and I found it. Um, University of Wisconsin, again, two tweets from them today. The record warmth in October has led to the Great Lakes water temperatures being well above the long-term average here. And these are not anomalies. These are actual temperatures. You know, you got Ontario and Erie, uh, Michigan, Hudson, Huron, Lake Hudson. No, try again, Mark. You get the idea. The lakes are warm and warmer than average. Some of these in here, this is the 50 degree delineation. Let's see what I can use to kind of make this stand out. There's 50 degrees. This is in Fahrenheit. 
for whatever reason they did these in Fahrenheit um, and you can see the warmth down here Lake Erie Lake Ontario the, and there's no data over here because it was getting blocked they do this at night it's a very interesting way that they collect these water temperature profiles um, and you can read it in their blog here I'll put a link to it in today's description why does it matter because the warm lakes lead to lake effect snows when cold dense air moves across those warm lakes and that will be something travelers are going to want to watch for over the next few days certainly heading in the next week and me us this project because lake effect snows are very interesting to me especially off of Ontario going into the area between Syracuse up into Watertown the Tug Hill region deeply fascinated with that it's a very interesting part of the country they get a lot of snow there on occasion and these bands will set up coming right across Lake Ontario especially yes you can get the lake effect snow coming off of Erie Cleveland Ohio can get big lake effect events I get that but that's a big population area everybody's gonna be shooting those events on these devices Tug Hill area not as densely populated and so I like to set up cameras there I did that once in 2020 study now some of the thermal profiles using some of our Kestrel instruments that we have and even some of our, um, some of our anemometers we have uh, several of them bottom line this is the recipe for a busy off season for us to go up and study some of these lake effect events and of course they can affect you if you're traveling anything coming well let's take a look real quick at the GFS going out into time this would be the lower 48 as I call it there's Maine there's eastern Massachusetts this is the mid-Atlantic the Carolinas and Florida just to give you an idea of your geography here and then here's the west coast Mexico Baja California up through um, British Columbia Vancouver area all right you got it you know your geography now good let's move this out into time general weather map cold air coming in that's what you see here these thicknesses lowering um, and that's cold air coming in northwest flow on the back side of that storm system but nothing big time no like oh my goodness look at that blockbuster storm but enough cold air draining in out of Canada to bring some lake effect bands you can see some of those there this is about three days out so maybe the lake effect machine starting to crank up a little bit the high slides east and then we reload and do it again with a larger more powerful storm system as we get into early next week and again some of these lake effect streamers coming downwind of some of these lakes even bumping up against the Appalachians the northwest flow as we call it that could generate some accumulating snow in the Appalachians this is about a week out right now limited signs of travel headache potential stay tuned to that we're gonna need to look at that maybe later in the week uh, as we get to next week a lot of people millions of people will be traveling for Thanksgiving and we gotta keep an eye on that as well there'll be a lot of people talking about it I'll be one of them just to keep you informed you know give you my perspective on things and hopefully you blend that with other people that you follow on social media especially if you have to fly drive or take a train remember planes trains automobiles Steve Martin John Candy that's a classic for Thanksgiving that period of time is coming up and we're gonna to want to keep an eye on that gotta keep you guys aware keep you safe because I like having you here I appreciate it I appreciate your time and attention it's good to be able to talk to you and educate you about things related to hurricanes and then just my overall favorite weather topic or topic and that is weather weather is the topic that's what I'm trying to say all right I'll just say goodbye because I'm done that's all we need to cover for today you guys have a great rest of your uh, Tuesday afternoon again thanks for tuning in I am Mark Suttoth I'll talk to you again later in the week